Well, hello and welcome to RBC Online. It's fantastic to be joining you uh, for worship today. And I'm joined by Mike as well. How are you going, good, Mike? Good to be here. Yeah, I'm doing yeah. well, thank you. There's a few in our congregation that aren't at the moment. Yeah, yeah, there's a number of us with uh, COVID and uh, struggling Close with Close contacts and yeah. the whole school thing. It's just sort of <laughs> taken a lid off, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So we are praying uh, that those of you who are sick and may find yourself here uh, today uh, struggling with you know, flu-like symptoms or just getting over those uh, symptoms or just isolating just because someone said you had to, uh, yeah, we're thinking of you in our prayers and uh, praying Definitely. for you. Uh, we hope you vote yesterday, Mike. Well, if you didn't, it's a bit late now, it isn't is. it, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we are obviously, yeah, as this is coming out to you, we will have a new uh, government as well. Yes, so. well, hopefully we'll know by now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but just wanted to take the opportunity as well, just as we come into worship, uh, just to pray. Um, it's a, um, yeah, it's something that we uh, do as an act of worship that we can um, just, yeah, focus our minds on God and the reason why uh, we do come and worship Him. So let's come and do that. Glory to you, Almighty God. You spoke and light came out of darkness. Water rose from confusion. You breathed into the dust of the earth and we were formed in your image. You looked on the work of your hands and declared that it was all good. And still you speak, breathe life and look for us. We praise you. Well, let us come and adore and worship in that same vein, our Lord and Heavenly Father. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. 
everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us on our online segment for this week. Um, you'll remember Matthew, one of our senior leaders upstairs. Hi. Hey Matthew, how's your week been? Not bad. Not you and yours? It's been good. Yeah. Do you know what I was doing yesterday? I was walking my dog, Lily, mm -hmm. along the park and I came across a bike rider who'd fallen over. Oh no. She had a couple of friends with her, but I helped them call an ambulance mm. and waited to check that she was okay and then kept walking Lily because Lily gets impatient. Yes. Well, I'm glad that you were there to help her out and to help them feel better. Well, that's great that we talked about that because your story actually ties into our teaching for this week, which is from Luke chapter 5. And it's about a paralyzed man who had this amazing group of friends to help him. Let's watch the story. The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Luke, chapter 5. Verses 17 through 26. Imagine living in Judea 2,000 years ago. If you got sick, there were very few doctors. If you couldn't see or hear or walk, there was no one you could turn to for help. Please, help me. But when Jesus began to travel and teach and heal, suddenly there was hope. A way to get better and start life all over again. Stories of Jesus reached a man in Capernaum who couldn't walk and his four friends. Let's call them Leo, Mike, Raph, and Donnie. Jesus is in town. Right here in Capernaum. Over at Joe's house. Ginormous crowd, dude. The man who couldn't walk tried hard not to get his hopes up. I can't even get there, much less fight my way through a crowd. You don't have to. Cause we got you. Ready? Dude, one. Two, three, lift! The four friends each grabbed the corner of the man's mat. Together they carried him out of the house and down the dusty road. Soon, they could hear the sounds of a large crowd. There's Joe's place, oh yeah! What's happening? People jammed in 20 deep around the door. We got religious leaders, teachers, poor people, rich people, standing room only. Actually, there's no standing room, dude. Only room is up. Sure enough, around the back of the house, the four friends discovered a narrow staircase up to the flat roof. Wait, how is this any better? And down, dudes. Hold it. We can't even hear Jesus. Oh, we can't hear him yet. That's about to change. Help me pry up this clay. It's time to raise the roof. Within minutes, the four friends pried up large sections of packed clay to reveal a rough thatch of sticks connecting the roof beams. <laughs> Gotta bust these out. And voila! As dust and beams of sunlight spilled into the room, the four friends could see the shocked crowd gaping up at them. The only one who didn't seem shocked was the man at the front, watching them with deep, kind eyes. Jesus! Hey, all y'all people down there, get ready, because our friend is coming through. The four friends each grabbed the corner of the mat and began to lower their friend into the rough hole they had created. Hey, what's going on? Hey, wait. You can't do this. What is this? Hold on. In spite of the confusion, the man who couldn't walk was finally lowered to the floor, right in front of Jesus. The nerve! Just look at all this damage. Jesus wasn't looking at the damage or the shot crowd. His eyes went from the man on the floor to the four faces peering through the hole in the roof. In their eyes, he'd read what they'd done and how certain they were that he could heal their friend. He saw their faith. Then, Jesus smiled at the man on the floor. Friend, your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders didn't dare speak their thoughts aloud, but inside their heads, they were nearly screaming. Who is this fellow to 
say such an evil thing? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus could tell exactly what was going on in their heads and hearts. Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? He wouldn't dare. Well, at least everyone will see he's a fraud. Jesus had God's power to meet the greatest need of the man who couldn't walk by forgiving his sins. But that wasn't something the religious leaders could see. So Jesus gave them something they could see. I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus looked down again at the man on the mat, right into his eyes. Get up, take your mat and go home. It seemed that everyone, from the four friends on the roof to the people jammed in the doorways and windows, was holding their breath. The man who couldn't walk sat up. Then he stumbled to his feet. His friends cheered. Oh, you got this! Deep breath. Baby steps. Bring it, dude. The man took a step, a hop, a leap. Ah! I can walk! I can walk! Praise God! The man grabbed his mat and danced out of the house to meet his friends for a group hug. The crowd was amazed and filled with wonder. Most unusual thing I've seen in all my years. Well, praise God! Praise God! Through the power of God and the help of a few friends, the man who once couldn't walk now ran home on his own two feet. His life forever changed. Okay, so that was a great story. Um, when we see others with needs that seem huge and overwhelming, we often think they're too big for us to help and end up doing nothing. However, if we cooperate with others to meet those needs, we have a better chance of making a difference in their life. That's what happened yesterday when several of us got together to help this lady who'd fallen off her bike. And that's the bottom line. Work together to help someone in need. Well, that's great. And our memory verse for this month is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Two people are better than one. They can help each other in everything they do. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Great to be engaging with our kids as well, isn't it? Look, um, the life of the church goes on, and there is always things happening, but there's not a lot happening that we need to address this week. Particularly, though, we'd like to flag that we're going to do the National Church Life Survey, commonly known as NCLS, after the service. So stay tuned, and we'll let you know how that can be done. And uh, you preached last week for us, Mike. And, oh, I seem uh, to remember that, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a wonderful message, lovely engagement to that. But I'm wondering, out of the passage that you uh, preach from, is there, is there a verse that really stands out to you? Oh, there is. There yeah. certainly is. It, it's that one, uh, verse 17 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, where Paul prays. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I love this next little bit, that you may know him better. That, yeah. that would be for me, the guts of the message in a way. Yeah. And as we've kind of stewed on what you brought us last week, as we've, um, yeah, just mar marinated the, over that the last week or so, I wonder for you, mm. um, is there a time this week that's just passed where there's been a glimpse of, you know, that that was God or you know that that's something he just revealed to me yeah yeah like that it might be as, as we're here right now just reflect on that um, and uh, yeah be encouraged by God who is stepping with us all yeah and, our lives. and he goes on doesn't he to pray about the the um, the eyes of our heart might be enlightened and he picks up those two things that I talked about hope and power so yeah so maybe it's where you found hope this week or uh, We'd love to hear if you've really had an experience of God's power in your life this week too. Yeah. 
or maybe if there is something you'd like to share, uh, you can drop it in the chat or leave a comment uh, if you're on Facebook and encourage the community here as well um, as we do life uh, together here online in our online community. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the offering line. It does, it does. And now it's an opportunity uh, for us to continue in worship and you'll find details of how we can do that and be part of that on the screen now. Uh, but wonder if we can come and pray. Uh, yeah. Also, also might be a good idea uh, to pray for uh, some of the things that are happening yeah. in our world. Definitely. Uh, we can pray for uh, the government that's just been elected. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, a number of other things that may be on your heart as well uh, that you can be lifting up in prayer as we pray. So let us come and pray now. Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that you give us everything that we have. And um, yeah, you gave more than we can ever imagine or grasp. Uh, and uh, yeah, may you uh, continue to reveal uh, just how much you gave so that we may have life, uh, that we may have uh, the fullness of life that Mike uh, kind of expounded uh, for us last week. And we just pray that as, as we, uh, in an act of worship, give uh, towards you, uh, in an act of worship, give towards uh, things that may be happening in the world. We think of, um, yeah, Baptist World Aid giving as well uh, in this. And we just pray that you would use all of that in our community and around the world um, so that people may experience your love, your grace and your peace at this time. Yeah, and Lord, uh, just as we would want to be generous with uh, our giving, so we'd want to be generous with our attitude of love and care and compassion. So we remember at this time what's going on in the Ukraine and that conflict and how that is affecting so many uh, citizens, uh, women, uh, the young, the old, uh, children, and of course many men on the fighting lines. So Lord, we continue to pray for your intervention, uh, for a bringing of peace in that context, even though we can't conceive how that would be. And we pray particularly for those who are displaced, those who are grieving, those who have lost everything. And we pray, God, that uh, somehow you would be at work in that setting. And Father, as we remember that situation, so we are so very, very thankful for our liberal democratic society that we live in. And we just had an election and uh, Lord, the, a government has been appointed. Uh, so, Lord, we pray for our leaders as they take up the reins and as they um, lead us in the political sphere in this state. We pray your blessing upon them and we pray, God, that you would lead us through them. So, Lord, thanks again that you are the source of everything. And whatever our circumstance or situation, you are our God. And we want to bless you and praise you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to come now and we're going to continue in our Ephesians series as Ian Ellis uh, brings us the message for today. Hello everyone, it's wonderful to be here with you today. You know, over the last few weeks, I've noticed a number of people have been posting online on social media some glorious sunrises. I wonder if you've seen any good sunrises near where you are at the moment. Summer sunrises can be just so beautiful. I remember when I was a child and one day I was going to go on a holiday. I was so excited, I was up super early. And as the sun rose, I was out in the street already waiting for the day to begin. I think I was still in my pajamas actually. And there was this high sky, drifts of cloud lit pink and red and purple and gold all against the soft blue of the early morning. What a way to be reawakened to the start of a new day. I wonder if you have a favorite memory of a time when you were reawakened by the gift of the beauty of a new day. Our prayer in this Ephesian series is that we'll be reawakened to the absolute beauty and power of the new day, the new creation and the good news we have received in Jesus Christ. And that each one of us will be reawakened to our true identity, to our true purpose as God's children 
and to our true purpose as the community of Jesus that this letter reveals is as big and beautiful as could be and worth waking up to. The first chapters of Ephesians are incredibly rich, almost so rich that it's hard to take them in. Every phrase is filled with meaning. Every verse builds on the last and they have the power to reawaken us to the true horizons of our faith. You know, we are not just people coming to church. As Paul will say at the end of chapter 2, we are a people built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone to become a dwelling in which God lives to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And you know, friends, as the world keeps changing, it's important that we know what it means, what it truly means to be a people, to be a dwelling together in this world where God lives by his spirit. And friends, as this world keeps changing around us, we need to see even more the sunrise of a people shining onto the communities around us that we would be a people who show this world what they need to see, the sunrise of a people reawakened to the true beauty of our humanity in Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we pray that your spirit will enlighten our hearts, Lord, that we will see you more, that we will be lifted up, Lord, to realise that we are claimed by God that we are built into a, an amazing place where you live by your spirit. Take hold of your word today and change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I wonder what it was like for the people of Ephesus to begin to encounter this church of Jesus. We know that Ephesus was a very successful and important city in its region. We know that Ephesus was the centre of a significant religious system based on the worship of the goddess Artemis. The temple of Artemis of Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But it was a city that suddenly had a new and beautiful light shining in it. A city suddenly changed in wonderful ways as people were being awakened to what life is really about as Jesus was preached and revealed in their midst. They encountered for the first time a God different in every way from all the other gods they'd submitted to or heard about. And when they were awakened to the truth about who God really is through the light of the revelation that we have in Jesus, many of them found that they no longer had need for their old so-called gods. In Christ, they were awakened to a God worthy of the name of God. So different. So much better than that they could ever imagine a God to be actually alive and powerful in love in their lives. The God over all and the God for all. A God who gives us our true identity as Ellie unpacked in week one of our series and a God who loves us and is for us and whose power works in us as Mike spoke last week from Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1. The gospel of Jesus was bringing a new day a new awakening for Ephesus. Acts 19 tells us that such large numbers of people were turning to Jesus that the worship of Artemis and the trade of those who supplied her trademark silver statues was noticeably going down. As the church grew, people were being healed by Jesus. Demon-possessed people were being freed. And Jews and Greeks were coming together, which was remarkable, and they were openly confessing their sins to one another. And those who'd been practicing sorcery were bringing their books of magic and turning to the power of the living God, and great joy and love were in their midst. God was at work in Ephesus through his church. And it was all happening through the preaching and the receiving of who we are in Christ, and God granting to more and more people the grace to receive this wonderful good news with faith. This was a church well taught and well loved and doing well and seeing God at work. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have the secrets that Paul taught that church over the three years he ministered there? Paul under God established a church able to have a real impact in its hostile world. What did he teach them? What was the teaching that this church was built on? What plan or program did he focus on? Well, we have it here. I'm sure that this letter is Paul's distillation of three years of teaching. Paul distilling down 
in the four pages in my Bible and yours, what is most important for us to know. And already Ellie and Mike have been reawakening us to what Paul was revealing that we have received in Christ. Let's just see some of the sunrise again. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're blessed by God. Verse 4. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We're chosen by God. Verse 5. Adopted as God's inheriting children through Christ. We're enriched by God. Verse 6. Forgiven and redeemed through Christ's sacrifice for us. We're set free by God. Verse 18. Called to a certain and blessed future. We're filled with hope by God. Verse 20. His power for us, the very same power that raised Christ from the dead, empowered by God. And verse 23, lifted by God to a position in Christ far above every spiritual power, raised to true life by God. And the wonderful message that comes through it all is that it's God doing this work in us and for us and through us. Paul's prayer, as Mike taught us last week, was not that they would firstly do more, but that they would firstly see more that the eyes of their hearts might be opened by God to see God, to see all that he's done and is doing and will do for us and in us and through us as we live in Christ. What a glorious sunrise. What a wonderful gospel. What an amazing life God had opened for them and for us. And yet, for those who know their Bible, the Ephesian church is also very much a warning church for us to take seriously the call to be often and fully reawakened to him as his people. For we know one sad thing about this church, this church that had been taught so well, which had seen God at work so much. We know that there was a time that would come later when words of warning would be spoken to the Ephesian church by the Lord himself through John in Revelation 2. He said, I have this one thing against you, Ephesian church. You've forsaken the love you had at first. When a woman poured oil on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her tears, which you can find in Luke 7, a Pharisee called Simon was affronted at her intrusion. But Jesus said, and I'm paraphrasing here to save time, Simon, when I came in here today, you just took me for granted. But this woman has shown the depth of her love for me. I want to be someone you want to be someone. We want to be a people together, don't we, who continue to be awakened to and to respond to the love and the grace and the forgiveness that's flowed to us from the cross of Jesus Christ. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a saviour. And it's to this place, dear friends, of remembering how much he loved us when he went to that cross for us that the first few verses of chapter 2 of Ephesians take us. It's so easy to take all that we have received in Christ for granted. Perhaps for some of us it seems a long time ago that in need we first came to him as saviour. Perhaps the memories of him drawing us away from the cliff of shame, from the burdens of guilt and from the fear of judgment have faded with time. Perhaps we've forgotten how heavy was the weight of our sin that he's taken upon himself for us. And we can begin to think that we're not really so bad after all and that what we have in him is something ordinary, something maybe we even deserve, something lightly given. How much has Christ saved us really? And so Paul shines the light again on the wonder of our salvation in order that our love of Christ would shine brighter in us as he begins chapter 2 like this. I'll read Ephesians 2, 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Can we stay here for just a minute? In this place of truth, I speak to myself as much as to you, 
and to those who have not yet responded to Jesus' love. For those in Christ, let us allow ourselves to be reminded of our former position. As for me, I was dead in my transgressions and sins. I wonder if you'd repeat that with me using uh, the first person for yourself. Let's say it together. As for me, I was dead in my transgressions and sins. For those yet to respond to Christ, please allow the truth of your true spiritual position to move your heart quickly to Christ for the sake of the forgiveness only he can offer. As for you, you were dead. You are dead. Beyond hope in an eternity apart from God, you may be still walking around and breathing, but the sin within is a killer. Dead in your transgressions and sins. All of us are by nature deserving of wrath, as Paul says in verse 3. Let us not downplay our situation outside of Christ. The backdrop of the wonderful sunrise of the grace of God is the dark curtain that the wages of sin is death. And you, you're not alone, for we all fall short of the glory of God, as Paul says for us all at the end of Romans 7. Who will rescue me from this body of death? We know that this following of Jesus is not adding something on to our existing lives. Christianity is not trying to be a little bit better for God. Are there any good gardeners here? I remember one of the TV gardeners years ago defining a good gardener as being someone who has the ability to see that a plant is dead and stop trying to make it better. Just pull it out, get rid of it, and start again. It's bad news to find out that the plant of your spiritual life is dead, but it's good news to be told that you can stop trying to water that old dead plant of trying to be good enough and to see planted in you something new, start afresh, something with life in it, something which contains the seed of the very life of God. That's our good news. You are dead, says Paul, and that's straight talking. And not just dead because you managed it entirely alone, because Paul then talks about the sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see, we can think it's just us. And it's just whether we decide to be good or not, but Paul makes it clear there are powers beyond our sight and understanding and control that affect us all and that infect us all, whether we like it or not. That internal wrestle we have all experienced, it's not just us. As human beings, we have a com common enemy with access to our souls. There is a spirit of evil in this world. If you don't believe me, that there's a spirit of evil in this world, that I invite you to watch the six o'clock news. There is a spirit of evil that wants you to fail, to be unlovely, to be untrustworthy, to be disloyal, to do all that you know you should not do, to be away from God. Ultimately, that spirit wants you to die. We might think we can master all of life with our minds and with our wills, but the Bible teaches that we are not in control of all things. We need help. There is nothing we can do of ourselves to save ourselves from the combined forces of our own sin and the evil in this world. But, oh how wonderful that that word is in scripture here, the word but. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let's repeat that together. But because of his great love for me, let's say it together, but because of his great love for me, God, who is rich in mercy, God, who is rich in mercy, made me alive with Christ, made me alive with Christ. 
and raised me up with Christ and raised me up with Christ and seated me with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus and seated me with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that sound good to say? Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. What does that tell us about God and us? It tells us God is filled with love for you and me, for us. How great is the love of God for us? Infinitely great. He stopped short at nothing to pour out his love to us, even the giving of Christ for us. This verse is so powerful as it reminds us that if you want to describe our God in one word, in his position towards us, there's only one word you would choose. As John teaches, God is love. And so that also informs us with something powerful about who we are becoming in him, people who love because he first loved us. And what else do these verses tell us about God? It says God who is rich in mercy. The word here is the same that would be used for a very rich man, for a billionaire. God is a billionaire in mercy. Do you need mercy? God is a billionaire in mercy. Even though the sins we commit should condemn us, he shows us mercy from his riches of mercy. Not in overlooking our just punishment, but in taking it upon himself. He has been, and he is, a billionaire of mercy to you and to me. And so we know that it is for us who have received mercy, such mercy, to be those who are rich in mercy to others. And what else does this tell us about God and us? It tells us about the wonder of his grace. It is by grace you have been saved. His grace, his undeserved favour to us that not only saves us as humans, but lifts us above the powers of this world that once controlled us and above what we could ever have expected from a relationship with God to be those grace, to be allowed into the inner sanctum of being received in Christ and to be graced with a seat, a place of rest near to the heart of God. As those who will forever live to give testimony to the greatness of the grace of the one true God. This letter to the Ephesians in spelling out the gospel is reminding us that God has entered this world and revealed that at the eternal heart of this universe is fullness of love and richness of mercy and wonder of grace. And that's an awesome revelation to receive for it shows also the fulfillment of our destiny as humanity because the God who has done all this is not going anywhere until all things are together under the lordship of love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I find that wonderful to know because many days when we look around it might not look like such beautiful things as love and mercy and grace will win. But friends, this is our truth. This is our God who holds our future and frames our eternity. And this is the truth that when its light begins to shine in the human heart, brings the dawn of a bright future. There is no way for, forward for us all except through the beauty of the sunrise that's been revealed through Jesus Christ. This planet needs Jesus. One of the hardest things for many of us to believe is that we really can be good enough or worthy enough or lovely enough for God to love us this much. And maybe we can't, but God loves us anyway. And so, so Paul presses into this soft point again in verse 8. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it's the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For it is by grace you have been saved. The undeserved, loving, merciful, surprising, shocking, outrageous favour of God. It's a gift. That's how we've been saved. That's how you can be saved today. As a gift from God to you through faith which simply means to trust what he's done for you. Salvation is God's gift of absolute grace to absolute sinners. 
I love the quote of Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great Bible teachers of last century. He said, if your preaching of the gospel of God's free grace in Jesus Christ doesn't seem outrageous in its generosity, then you're not preaching the gospel of the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. Because to human minds and human judgments, his grace in choosing us, in welcoming us to be so close with him, it's outrageous. But it's true. Do you know the grace of God in your life? Or are you still trying to make it on your own? Give up on that old dead plant. God has a new life for you in Christ. A life not of your own making, a life he's made for you. A life he's planned for you to show to this world that needs to see it that there is a better way to live. A best way to live. A way where God's love and mercy and grace invades and enlightens your life, your home, your school, your work, your society. And it brings life and joy and hope and where you participate with his strength in the good things. The good works, the honourable and loving and creative and purposeful and community building and restoring works. He and his love for you and others has planned for you, just for you to do in his grace. Let's pray. Let's just pause here for a moment and allow, just ask for the reawakening light of the sunrise of the gospel of Jesus to flood into your heart. Open up your heart, say, Father, Pour the light, the beautiful light, the sunrise, the gorgeous sunrise of the gospel, the good news that Jesus loves me this much, has been so merciful to me, is so merciful to me, and has graced me so much with his undeserved favour that I would be called a child of God. Father, fill our hearts with the knowledge of Jesus today, we pray. And Father, as we wait in prayer before you, we pray that you will open our eyes to see you even more and more, no matter how long we've been following you. Open our eyes to see you afresh. Your love, your grace, your mercy, fill us afresh and cause us to overflow with your love, with your mercy and with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Well, isn't it great to have God's Word open up to us again today? Uh, I was thinking about what Ian's shared, and I'm reading again verses 4 and 5 out of chapter 2, where Paul says, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. It's an amazing concept, isn't it? And it takes me to John, and where Jesus talks about the fact that he came to give fullness of life. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder how we're perhaps experiencing that. Yeah. And I mean, it is it is not just an ordinary life. I think, you know, we, we, can, get, we can get lost in it and it feels like a drag and all, all of that kind of stuff, but it is meant to be experienced and experienced well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not just a fine tuning of the life we had before. No. It's actually uh, made a life in a new way, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's a fullness of life, but it's actually a new life. You know, elsewhere, Paul talks about the fact that, uh, you know, we are a new creation. The old is gone. Um, yeah. So that this, this concept of life mm. and being made alive in Christ you know, is a rich one to dwell on. Yeah, yeah. And that is something that can be experienced now, but it is yeah. also um, talking about the life that is to come as yes. well. Yes, yes. Um, the now but not yet. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a, it's like a, you know, if, if we are experiencing that, that brokenness or if we are experiencing, you know, life that doesn't feel quite full, you know, there, there might be glimpses of a full life right now, but, um, you know, but it is that that glimpse is the fullness of the full life that is to come exactly. still. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So those little, um, I, I don't know what you call it, little, Paul uses the word foretaste, doesn't he? Like yeah. Little foretastes. We should look for them in our life, even in the midst of struggle and, and great wrestle with things or circumstances, but look for the foretaste. So yeah. maybe where, where are the foretastes that you can see in your life at the moment yeah. for a perfect and full life? Mm. Mm. It's that much time can be uh, yes. given to... But we should uh, move on. Yeah, <laughs> dwelling on this concept, but encourage you throughout your week uh, to do some of that, just to take some time and, uh, yeah, just think on that for, yeah. you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, but we are going to uh, come now and, um, yeah, I'll tell you about the NCLS survey and how can, you can have access to that. Uh, so um, you should have re received some emails that may be in the hello or there might be a specific email about with a link uh, to the survey online. Um, also, if you're on our church online platform, there'll be a, a button in the chat you can uh, click through to that. Uh, but if you're on our Facebook platform, um, join our Facebook group. I will share the, uh, the, the link in there. Um, but if you can't find it, can't, you know, and really want to be part of it, um, just send a message to the church page and someone will provide you uh, with the link as well. So there's yeah. a number of ways to be right. involved in it. We're trying to make it as easy as we can, but unfortunately yeah. we can't just put it on the screen for you because that would make it public. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, encourage you, uh, if you call RBC online uh, your home or RBC uh, in person your home, uh, to be part of this survey, we really uh, think it will be helpful uh, for us as we go forward uh, in the coming years to hear back uh, these results yes. from the survey. They're always very helpful. Yeah. Mm. Well, Mike, I think that's the end of our time together. It is. It is. So um, God bless you this week. Think back. Where are those little foretastes of God at work in your life? And uh, may God bless you for this week.